record. Okay, all yours. All right. <clears throat> I'd like to call the, this meeting to order the meeting of the Philoma Police Committee on February 15th at three o'clock in the afternoon. In attendance today um, is myself, Teresa, uh, Councillor Nielsen, Councillor Lehman, um, Peggy Yoder, uh, Chief uh, Rubin, and our city manager, Chris Workman. Uh, Councillor Bisco will be arriving late or um, at, depend on, um, on her meeting time. She had a conflict of interest um, with this meeting time. So um, I guess our, so I wanna first off uh, welcome Councillor Lehman as a new police committee member and Councillor Bisco as well. Thank you so much for joining us. I did not the learn the lessons of police committee person and so they failed me and made me do it another term. So here we are. <laughs> nice. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Chief Ruben, we, we love police committee. Just saying, love it, love it. So I'm um, glad to be here again. Uh, our guests, our uh, first order of business will be um, to approve the minutes. Uh, we have minutes from the October 26th. Oh, I didn't mention Peggy. Peggy, did I? We didn't do a roll call. Let's rewind for a second. Let's do a roll call. Um, I, did, I, did I mention Peggy Yoder in the roll call? Yes, she did. Yeah, you did. Oh, thank you. Sorry. I didn't miss you, Peggy. I didn't want to do that. Um, so we actually do need to call um, to approve the minutes from the October 26th uh, meeting uh, or acknowledge any amendments to said minutes. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes? I know, Matt, you weren't there, but you can still approve, I heard, even though you weren't in attendance. Oh, in that case, then I definitely would move to approve the minutes. <laughs> Could you do that during city council meetings, please? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> no, okay. So we'll, uh, um, so that's uh, moved by Councilor Lehman, and I will second that. Um, do we need to have any discussion about those minutes on the 26th? Um, Chief Rubin, any discussion you want to have about those minutes? All right, and Chris, I can't see you, Chris. Uh, anything about the minutes before we, we vote on them? Nope, oh, nothing for me. If there's no further discussion, let's all in favor of approving the minutes for a uh, police committee meeting for October 26th of 2021, please indicate. All righty, thank you. All right, um, any opposed? I think we have both votes on the two of us voted, so we're good. Motion is passed unanimously, woo. All right, <clears throat> onward. Um, we have on the agenda to a selection of a committee chair, but since all three committee members are not in attendance at this time, we're going to put that off until the next um, police committee meeting, if that's all right. Councilor Lehman, would that be all right with you? All right, so we will go forward um, and turn over the time to Chief Ruman to address the other agenda items listed on today's agenda. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, so I'll, I'll just offer this up to you, Matt, too. So at the beginning of a term, I always encourage you, and, and I'll do the same with Catherine, to, um, you know, I, I think it's, and I'll, I'll point to Teresa, I think it'd be good if you get an hour or two one day that you could come by the office and I could kind of give you the lay of the land about our budget, um, give you a tour, talk about some important projects that we're working on, um, statistics, those kinds of things. I think it's behind the scenes, looking at the budget, like the line items and how we come up with our budget every year is really important for this committee at moving forward. So if you've got a couple hours just to come by and have a cup of coffee and chat about stuff, um, you could do it at the same time as Catherine. Um, I haven't arranged a date for her. Anytime that works for you, um, I'd love to meet with you. Teresa's come a number of times and past committee members have always taken advantage of that. And I think it's really important that you guys kind of know kind of the inside workings sure. of the department. Love to have you come down. Um, I think it makes asking questions at these meetings because this is a, um, a liaison committee. Um, and when I'm briefing you guys on different topics, it's great that you're all, we're all on the same page. So sure. anytime you can come by, I'd love to have you, Matt. And we're on other uh, boards and things together with the POIC and different things. And uh, anytime you can squeeze a couple hours, that'd be great. Okay, perfect. Um, so that being said, um, our first order of business is DOI stats. Um, we've talked about this in the past, but I, I wanted to have this for you, Matt, um, and I, and Catherine also for your first meeting. Um, and I, I wanna bring this up because it's a topic countywide right now. Um, WCJC, the Willamette Criminal Justice Council, we're talking about impacts of Measure 110 on police departments right now as just our um, first part of the year. I'm the chair of the WCJC this year. 
And one of the topics was DOI enforcement because all three of the big agencies, you know, Benton County Sheriff's Office, Corvallis PD and Albany PD and Lynn County have seen a sharp rise of DUIs uh, in 2021. And we're trying to get our heads wrapped around that. Um, and I just wanted to present the stats to you guys. So as, if this comes up at future meetings and as we talk um, moving forward, um, it's good that you guys know what's going on in town. So um, in 2020, we had 30 DUIs and if just to point out, did you get that, the stat sheet that I sent out? Okay, um, I kind of broke it down the way we charge DUIIs so you can see the, the line items. And that's the way DUIIs are charged by not just um, the circumstances of the actual arrest itself, but um, they're categorized by how uh, intoxicated you are technically by um, the statute, which is you know, 0.08 to 0.14, 1.5 to 1.9, and they break it into those brackets. So we actually keep stats in those brackets like that. So when you get up to two point, you know, point two zero or above, that's like go to the hospital drunk. Um, right. And we and we've actually had, I think, three in twenty twenty where it was point three zero or above. Um, which wow. And one of them, uh, you would never know she was she was intoxicated. I mean, you know she's intoxicated, but you would never know she was a three zero. Um, we're talking about a, a long, like a fifteen year alcoholic um, driving. Um, and when the officer stopped her, she had a gallon of vodka in the car and just handed it over to the officers during the stop. Um, she drove to the coast back and forth every day, twice a day to, as part of her job. Um, and it's just an absolute miracle that, um, that she survived the number of years driving like that. But um, it was just an odd, odd case. But anyway, um, the number I want to point out to you in the 2020 is the DUI drugs uh, category. Uh, so, so we've talked about this a little bit in the committee in the past, Matt. Um, so sorry, Teresa, I'm going to go over this again. So just for Matt's uh, benefit. So on a DUI, a regular standard DUI case, uh, when, the, from the, when the officer makes a stop all the way to the very end of the, where you go into the, um, you know, the room and, and do the breathalyzer, and that, that's about a three hour process on average. I mean, it's uh, with all the legal technicalities of um, different forms we have to read to the person. When we're doing the test, we have to watch them in the in the room for a certain amount of time before they're given the breath test. There's forms that they have to be read verbatim in the room. And it's a long process. And if you've been through it before, which I hope you haven't, um, it's, a, it's, a long, it's a long process. Um, so that being said, in today's world, unfortunately with case law the way it is uh, in the statute, many people now are refusing to take a but breathalyzer, I'd say half the time now, um, I may be wrong, but that's about right. Uh, so what then happens, we're required at that time to take them to the hospital, write a search warrant, call a judge and get a telephonic search warrant to actually force the person to give a blood test at the hospital. That's by statute um, that we have, if they refuse, that's what, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. So then you're adding about two more hours so this last year, we were we started to keep stats on time, and our average booking time from stop to the when the person is released is about five and a half hours. Wow! So you do the math on that on routine stops for this kind of thing, and also assisting Benton County on their cases. That's that's a long time. So that's on a standard DUII with alcohol, drugs. What happens is it's a different spin because. Obviously, when we put them through the FS, the field sobriety tests, and we go through that whole process, when they come back, if our officer believes they're under the influence of drugs, when they take the breathalyzer, they'll commonly test zero, right? Because right. they don't have alcohol on board. So if that happens, uh, we go to the next step, which is we call what they call a, dr a drug recognition expert, a DRE. And unfortunately, we don't have any DREs anymore. The last one we had was Matt Mosier, and he now works for the sheriff's department. And that's a person that's gone through. Um, I think 80 hours of specialized training in addition to going to conferences and, and doing um, what they call wet labs, which are um, uh, live training with actual real people that have been drinking and evaluating and um, them. And we also do that because it's a drug case. Uh, they go to Portland and they go to the Multnomah County Jail and they evaluate um, people that are brought into the jail for drug use. And then they write reports on that and they get evaluated on their, their evaluations of people that are under the influence of drugs. 
So it's a long process to get somebody through it. So in those cases, we actually have to call a DRE in to do an evaluation on the subject that we have in custody for the, for the DUII. So Benton County currently has, I think, three DREs and Corvallis PD, I think, has two left. And then we call them in from home if they're home or on duty and they come in and do a, an evaluation on the person. And it's the same thing. It's about a two hour long, sometimes three hour long interview. And then they're required to take a, a urine test and a blood test during a DRE. And same thing happens if they refuse the DRE and our officer have to go to the hospital and take them up there. So the stats, the reason I'm bringing this all up is for obvious when you look at those stats, um, we're almost averaging two a month now um, on just on DRE drug cases. Right. So you'll learn from me right away. I, I hate statistics because in law enforcement, it's very difficult to tie direct correlations to certain statistics. I think people for political reasons and for all different kinds of reasons, misuse law enforcement statistics. Um, so like when I was at, when I was the chief of DOJ, we used to have to show every year that our drug, our major drug cases impacted armed robbery and burglary cases. Um, there's been proven correlations between uh, felony drug cases and property crimes. There's no doubt about it, there's a correlation. But sure. for you to say that my drug arrest at my statewide agency impact the statewide statistic, in, like statistics in Philomath, because we're doing these big drug cases, you can't do it. Right. And I hate that kind of stuff. And so that being said, I can't tell you today that Measure 110, um, which is primarily and is effectively a legalization of less than an ounce of many serious drugs like cocaine, methamphetamine, heroin, fentanyl, has affected DUI drug cases. But um, my, my personal opinion is I think it has. And I think also just in addition to um, Measure 110, the last three years or four years, the district attorney's office has treated felony possession cases as a misdemeanor. And many counties have just because of jail sure. um, shortages, those things. I actually think it actually goes back to that more than 110, just the whole thing moving forward. But what we're seeing and in our interviews with suspects is they know this and um, people, it's just like anything else, it becomes part of their life and they drive. Um, and we're seeing a gigantic, I mean, a basically our all time high, almost a double of our all time high, uh, which was 2020. And then before that, the most DUIs I can find in one year, I think was 24 um, going back as far as I can figure stats out. Um, sure. Do we so, know which which drugs are primarily the culprits here? It's pretty much across the board um, equal. Um, methamphetamine is about a third of them. Heroin's about a third, and fentanyl and opioids are the other third. Um, so heroin is an opioid, um, mm -hmm. uh, obviously a natural opioid. When I say natural, meaning it's not a synthetic drug. Sure. But fentanyl is a synthetic opioid, um, and we just got a gigantic seizure of. Um, uh, opioids just the other day. Blake um, Bowers, one of our officers, stopped a car about a week and a half ago and got um, a, uh, 254, 258 opioid counterfeit opioid pills that look like um, codeine pills, but they're actually fentanyl and about 58 ounces of fentanyl, pure uh, wow. powdered fentanyl, which is the equivalent of the if I could show you our little flyer, a three grains of fentanyl is about the head of a pin. Mm -hmm. So if you if you Google it right now while you're sitting there, uh, the amount of fentanyl that can kill you is three grains if you inhale it. Um, and he and this was the equivalent of be able to kill about two hundred, let's see, twenty two thousand people. Um, the amount of fentanyl that he sees the other night. Wow. So uh, the DEA and the Haida drug team over in Albany is um, helping um, prosecute that and do the further investigation. Um, but that started, that was a DUI case, by the way. Started, it was a DUI case. Blake arrested the guy for DUI, one o'clock in the morning, uh, just driving through town. And when he went to a, a place to handcuffs on him, he tried to run to the car to lock the door of the car. So uh, the guy doesn't know uh, he could lock the door. We still have legal authority to search it for um, the intoxicant uh, once you make an arrest. But 
Blake did the right thing as he uh, seized the car and working with the drug team, um, wrote a search warrant. He wrote the search warrant himself, got it signed by a judge and searched the car and then found the fentanyl in the car. So plus a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, but wow. that being that being said, um, just by the numbers alone, I'm hoping these don't but you know play out for the rest of this year, but they are we've already got five um, DUII so far um, this year. Okay. Um, I think uh, he had one last night, six, I mean, it might, might be six, but definitely five already. And four of those five were drug DUIs um, already this year so wow. far. So, okay. and this is a um, Corvallis PD and Benton County are seeing the exact same situation. So sure. um, I just wanted you guys, what part of this, well, uh, the main part of this, um, this committee is to brief you guys on uh, topics um, that are important to us that we're seeing in the city, crime topics, um, issues that we see, and this is one of them, um, and, and obviously it impacts our guys um, just for time being out of the field, because uh, you know many times the officer by himself at night, right? And uh, so you know if you get one of these, you're at, you know there's a there's no police officer in the in the city for five hours uh, right. because of this uh, a stop like that, but. Um, all things being said, you know, as I preach to the officers, um, DUI enforcement has got to be one of our top priorities. It's it's one of the things that regularly kills people. We had a number of um, traffic fatalities last year in the county. I, I think I think it broke. I don't want to say broke the record, but it was one of the highest years that we've had in in a long time. And um, as they as we get urine samples and blood samples back from those cases, many of them are drug um, have drugs related to them. Um, in gotcha. one way or the other. So, um, I've been seeing a lot in the newspaper lately about yes. traffic um, vehicle deaths are up, up dramatically too yeah. since the pandemic started. So, yeah. So, and I'll just oftentimes you'll hear me talk about my philosophy on certain things, um, and that's just I think it's important I share that with you guys. I'm a, I'm a I'm a keen believer in in narcotics enforcement. I've been a that's what I've done my whole career, um, and I think it's a really important. Um, uh, but now with the laws, the way they've changed, it, it really hampers us, our ability to interdict drugs uh, because major, because now um, if we see somebody with a needle in a car and a small amount of um, heroin or fentanyl, we can't arrest them. We can't get them out of the car. We can't um, search the car for additional drugs or, the, or evidence that they might be dealing drugs in our city uh, because that possession is now a violation not a crime anymore so because it's not a crime all the search and seizure laws don't apply to it it'd be the same if i see you with a pack of cigarettes in the car i can't i can't take them from you um, it's legal for you to possess them so we can't initiate a drug investigation if we see somebody that's an obvious you know heroin user or mm -hmm. a, a methamphetamine user or fentanyl user in the car we can't extradite them out of the car and um, do our regular um, investigations anymore um, so I gotcha. think over the long haul, um, it's going to really impact crime. Um, and, and in states where this has gone on for a number of years, like California, it, obviously um, crime has skyrocketed many. And, and I think um, you'll see over the next year or so, I think that's starting to come out that, that I think these rule changes and law changes do you know, significantly impact uh, crime. I mean, there's no doubt about it, it does. It's just about what to what level that sure. you know, correlation is right so um but it's important that you guys know as city council people when you know our local legislators are voting on these things on a statewide level that that we i brief you on this so that you guys can talk intelligently about issues and i anytime anything like, like this comes up and you guys want data um from us on these issues i'll be glad to give you any anything that we've got statistics wise or anecdotal case studies or anything like that sure. um, I can get you guys anything as we move forward if we're talking to one of the, you know, a congressman about our view on our stance on something. Um, Great. I'd love for you guys to have the right information as we move forward. So anyway, I noticed that, any, yeah, I noticed I, that you didn't mention marijuana at all in the drugs side. Yeah. Is that because it's hard to test for and because it stays in your system so long, you can't really prove that? No, we, uh, no, we did have, um, shoot, I, I didn't break down. I know a number of the I want to say four or five of the DUIs was marijuana. Um, I, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't break that out. Um, marijuana is very difficult. Um, 
because um, like you said, it stays in your system a long time. And we basically have to get a blood test to, to get any kind of result. A urine test won't um, give you the same um, quality results on the, sure. uh, the impairment. Um, we definitely see that. There's no question about it. And I, I'll be, it'll sound flippant, but I'll be direct with you that it's so common for people to be under the influence of marijuana. It's um, very, very difficult to differentiate sometimes between that and other drugs on board when you stop them. Mm -hmm. um, so our guys regularly stop people that are under the influence or have smoked marijuana recently and, and be able to prove a people can manage marijuana intoxication a lot better than some drugs, um, just physically. So to be able to see impairment to the level where it, it, an officer believes it impacts the driving capability of the person is mm -hmm. very, very hard. Gotcha. Um, so um that's a that's a tough one unless it's just so obvious on the driving um, right. like a, and it, 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 it's easy to crack jokes about marijuana but um uh blake's uh one of our officers uh the other night sees a he, no excuse me it was aaron uh elliot sitting at uh, uh, uh the timber supply parking lot and sees a guy coming down the hill and he's going like 12 miles an hour <laughs> at like uh 11 o'clock at night and he sees this guy go by and he's just going 12 miles an hour or 14 miles an hour down the street. It's like, okay, what's going on here? So we could joke about marijuana all day long, but he stops the guy and freely admitted it used it earlier, but passed all the test, the, the, the tactile tests. Sure. And it's like admitted he was using, but it's not enough. We, uh, which it would shock most people and Peggy's probably sitting there going, what are you guys doing? Um, but it, we have, even if the person is completely high or drunk, if they don't have show impairment during the test, we have to give them the keys and let them drive away. Wow. Which I, um, I, I still, I, I wish there was some law where we can say, look, I'm requiring you to, I'm taking your keys. Uh, I still believe you're under the influence and your danger. Uh, we need you to get a hotel room and the city will pay a hundred bucks for a hotel room tonight at the galaxy or whatever, because right. I just, it's just, uh, it's one of those community caretaking um, situations that um, I think we should be able to do, but there's no legal foundation and somebody can sue us for if we did something like that. Right. So, sure. but um, I think, I think if, if we were able to do it, most people would take us up on it uh, to be quite frank with you. Um, right. But it's just one of those things that is just not in our 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 kind of toolbox to be able to enforce those kinds of mm -hmm. things. So, wow. It, okay. So anyway, that's what's going on with DUIIs. Um, I'll continue to. This is a big topic. It's um, uh, we're looking at this at the county level. What's going on with prosecutions of DUIIs? The the chiefs association and the sheriffs association are trying to get the legislature to bring that bring this uh, measure 110 back up to make some al significant alterations. I don't know if you know, um, and we can talk about this in another meeting if you'd like, um, that the measure 110, uh, the goal is to get people into treatment, at least the stated goal. Right. And out of the, I don't remember the numbers, it's like 1300 people have been cited for measure 110 possession cases and like less than 20 people have, have voluntarily gone into treatment. Right. It's like some ridiculously low number. Uh, and our response to that was the chiefs and sheriffs were, we thought they should treat, um, if they wanted to go down this route to change the, 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 the drug laws, they should have made it similar to the DOI statute, which gives people the ability to expunge their first conviction. But upon the first arrest of possession, get them in a mandatory inpatient treatment process. Sure. Right. But um, and, I'll, and I'll, I don't I don't get involved in politics here ever because I think that's the uh, law enforcement and politics don't should never be on the same page yeah. ever. But um, the the money I, I think I think the legislature needs to put its money the money where the where it really this is an epidemic and we've encouraged the governor to make it a, just like he did with COVID right. make an emergency and. Fentanyl overdoses and drug overdoses and DUIIs are off the charts. People are get, get dying from this, and we need to make put our money where our mouth is. I am willing as a citizen to get to pay more money in taxes or whatever we need to do to get people into treatment and not just go to a meeting treatment. I'm talking about inpatient right. 
doctor treatment that the ones that work and i know there we don't have the facilities here to, to handle the amount that is out there but we need to get them um, because this isn't ever going to get solved until we take that part serious that's just my that's my sure. uh <laughs> it's not a political statement it's a it's a factual law enforcement statement from our view as in our world that's just that's just what it is and that that all that whole segment of uh, people that are in that are, are what causes crime a lot of it um property crime specifically to fund a habit um that we should uh, as a society uh, you know uh, treat, treat a little differently in my view um that's just so until that happens uh, stopping somebody and making it legal for people to possess it didn't is not working, um, and I don't think it's going to work. Um, I think there's legislators that still think it's going to work over time. I just don't, um, and and I think the cities are seeing an, a direct impact from that. We haven't seen it on the crimes that Corvallis is getting just smoked on, and I go to Chris all the time with the stats that we get from Corvallis PD. We we're uh, we're still about a one third right now of what um, Corvallis's crime rate is. Wow, that's Which, a big difference. Yeah, it's a big difference. Um, and, you know, when I was at Corvallis PD 25 years ago, it was exact opposite um, right. for a long time. And if you've lived in this city, you know that. I know Peggy's been around a long time. Crime was a lot different. And um, um, I think our our uh, tactics and our strategies have worked, um, at least till now. Um, I'm hoping we don't get a splash effect from, from Corvallis. We, we constantly fight that off. But um, it's, I, I, there's definitely a, a direct correlation between homeless people, um, drug abuse, mental health issues, um, and the and and the, the kind of way where the open door um, people getting uh, you know let out of jail without any consequences and get, not getting booked for certain kind of felony crimes. All that stuff weighs on on the system, and I think it's an unfortunate situation we're in right now. But um, Anyway, I'm done preaching. Uh, anyway, any questions on uh, on do on, on Dewey stuff that you guys have, or um, uh, have you ever been on a ride along, Matt? I have not. I was going to ask about that at the end of the meeting. Uh, um, uh, Teresa will tell you you got to bring cookies because she set the she set the bar high. Oh um, man! All right. How about scones? Um, Would scones work? Scones, oh scones, absolutely. Okay. Um, but you're welcome anytime. Um, it's a good place to get in a car with somebody, and ask all the all the questions you want, and uh, about how we do how we do business here, um, and I think it's a good eye opener, especially if you're on the committee. It's good that you come sure. out, and and you're welcome anytime. Just give us an advance notice. We'd like to have two people on duty when that happens, so that if you're so, that way, the the person that's got you in the car can go to other calls, and then they don't get tied up on a call that where you're sitting in a car for two hours, not able to do something. Right. That's happened. Sure. To, that happened to David Lowe. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. He got <laughs> stuck on a call for a couple hours and couldn't get out of the car. <laughs> which it, it you know it could happen but sure it's better if we have two people on duty when that happens so um gotcha. anyway okay let, let me know um, okay love i to, will do love to hook you up. okay any other thing Teresa? you're weirdly quiet um <laughs> so far so any questions on the DUI stuff i just have one question about property crime how um you said we are a third our crime rate is a third of corvallis yeah but our a rise in property crime in Philomath of late in 2021? Um, no, uh, it's a tiny bit, but not much. Um, so uh, I, that's where the stats lie, right? So I'll, I'll give you an example. So we had one crew of guys that came in and did like nine car break-ins. We arrested the one, one of the four people. Uh, they came from Tacoma in a stolen car. So that if you've got 27 car break-ins and one of them is one case where it's just one crew of people, it does a big impact, but if you're talking about, we look at those as a um, if one car, one group of four people in a stolen car do nine car break-ins in one night. That's a case for us, one investigation, but it's not, it's statistically, it's nine car break-ins. So if you were to look at that, oh, we had nine car break-ins uh, last week. Um, it's really one, uh, the way we look at it, Sure. Uh, but in the, at the end of the year, you say, oh, we had nine more than we did last year. It's actually, you know, it could be misleading, um, uh, but uh, property crimes have been pretty stable. Chris, what about what, the last four years now? Total numbers, four or five years? Um, yeah, pretty consistent. Like I said, we know when you, with a smaller population, when you don't have a lot of crime, any little bit of crime statistically is a large percentage, right? So like, like uh, Ken's saying, with statistics, you have to be careful. You really have to look at the long trend. Um, yeah. 
like you know, like Ken just said, you get some yahoos that come in from out of state, do a bunch of crime. Your statistics for that year are going to go way up, but really, it's one instant. But, but um, you know, it's nice help talking with Ken a little bit because when you understand that, yeah, there's 17 arrests there, or there's 17 burglaries there, but it was really one event, then it gives you a little bit better perspective on where things are headed. So you look for individual cases, you look for different areas within the city that are being affected. And, and overall, yeah, I think the trend is pretty, pretty flatlined. Um, yeah, we're, we're the, I tell really the guys, good. it's pretty, it's pretty funny to talk about. We're at the point now where I, I and I, so I'll say this in this group, I don't know if crime will go any lower. It's hard to it, just in any society, no matter how nice the city you live in, there's a certain, you're just going to have a certain amount of transit. And I don't mean homeless people. I mean, just outside sure. tra crime coming in. So uh, last year, 2021, we looked at crime stats and, and Dave and I did a deep dive on our cases compared to when I first got here in 2014-15, uh, where the vast majority, I think it was over 80% of people we arrested on property crimes lived in Philomath. Mm -hmm. And last year, it, it was like 8%. Wow. Something like that, 9%. It, that's actually what you want in, in the long term. Uh, you want to get to the point where you know, you don't have a lot of criminals living in your city, um, and the pressure from enforcement drives people that drives criminals away. But you're going to have people come from the outside occasionally and just stop in your town and do an armed robbery or stop in your town. Uh, the things that don't change are stuff like domestic violence, things that are you know uh, child abuse cases, sex abuse cases that are really 99% people that live in your town. Sure. Um, right. So another thing we're cleaned up a lot recently with um, when we went to a consortium of all the police agencies here to be on the same report writing system is being more consistent on how we report things. For instance, for years, it drove me crazy because our old report writing system, if you if we made an arrest for, um, let's say, armed robbery, let's say we stop a car and the guy in the car has an arrest warrant for armed robbery, we'd arrest the guy. We've never had an armed robbery in Philomath, but it would show as one armed robbery in Philomath, gotcha. right? Because we made yeah, an yeah. arrest for armed robbery. So our current, the new system that we have with the coding of crimes changes that. So we, we got a much better feeling because I would always come in to with, talk to stats with the, with the committee or with Chris, and I'd have to, hey, well, this one, we didn't really have four rapes last year. We had one. The other three were on warrants or we arrested a Corvallis PD guy going through town that was wanted for rape and we stopped them. So I'd always have to qualify our stats and it drove me nuts. Um, sure. It was pretty pathetic too. It was, listen to it was so, about it was, stats. It was, yeah, it was pathetic. So I, <laughs> but <laughs> it happens both ways too. Um, sure. Like we we're talking about the, the car break-ins, you know, we really do have on that day, we have nine break-ins on that day. There's nine victims. So you should report it as nine. But in, it, when, you're, when you're looking at a strategy, a crime strategy, um, and you look at this one year and you see a, a spike or whatever in, in whatever crime stats you're looking at, you just got to look at the stats realistically of what is really going on. Um, and it could be bad, more worse than it looks on paper or not as bad, depending sure. on how the stat gets reported. But um, anyway, I just, that's so why it sounds I'm, like all the bad people from Philomath are going to Corvallis to do their car break ins. That's what, we, that's what we're hoping that's happening, and uh, we <laughs> regularly drop people off over there um, when we're uh, when we want that to happen. Uh, uh, but it is funny how that happens. Uh, but it, you know, it is what yeah. it is. Corvallis is getting uh, like, for instance, last year I think we had five reported burglaries, residential burglaries. Two of them were not burglaries. Two of them were exactly what I was telling you: situations where a family member. <laughs> Stole, stole stuff. We figured out later that it was a family member. So right. we actually had three really real residential burglaries. And I think we had two uh, business burglaries last year. One of them was the Vinwood case and we arrested that guy. And the other one was a garage uh, storage for a business that we found out was a prior employee. Um, so do we have a burglary problem? No. But Corrales has a burglary problem. Corrales, right. I think they had, I, I can't remember, it's just unbelievable the numbers it's like in the 200 or 300 burg residential burglaries last year and for a while there they were averaging about 80 car break-ins a month and we Dang. had i can't remember the numbers but i think we had 26 or 28 26 i think for the whole year um right. of course we're one you know 
we're, you know, one eighth the size or whatever. So if you extrapolate it out per capita, it's still way more than us, but um, they're really getting, they're getting hammered over there on car break-ins. It's really, really bad. Um, and just thefts in general, shoplifting. We have one shoplifting or two a year. I mean, because we just don't have the businesses that you would shoplift sure. at, right? But Corvallis, every day, if you listen to the radio, it's, it's all day. Guy ran out of Safeway with a you know a cart full of steaks and you know every day. Um, wow, yeah. It's it's um, there's advantages to living here for um, and having the business environment that we have actually is a benefit sometimes where you don't have like a Walmart or a big store where you're going to have a lot of just uh, associated crime with those kind of stores, right? Sure. So, um, but anyway, I, at the next meeting, I'll plan. I got to just wrote a note. I'll I'll do a full on year review of stats if you guys want to see it for Absolutely. 2020 versus 2021, and we can go through the whole uh, breakdown of all the different kind of thefts. I think there's 20 categories of thefts, you know, so we can wow. break all that down and look at that stuff. And I'll be glad to brief you guys on that. Sweet. Okay. And one other thing. One other sure. thing, Ken. I was talking to a friend the other day out in Tillamook, and they're having um, well some cases of illegal growers of marijuana. Um, I, I don't know if they're legal, but they're having some, there are growers that are, are not licensed. And sure. are we, I know there was one, wasn't there one outside of yeah. Philoma? Yeah, we just did a case. Our, it, um, we did the case with the DEA because um, the, the subject uh, did live in town, but the grow was on Noon Road. So mm -hmm. you guys know where Noon Road is? Yeah. Uh, Teresa mm -hmm. might not. Um, as you're going out just past the old Mary's River uh, uh, plywood mill or the uh, cedar mill. Mm -hmm. That road, if it goes back, uh, I can't remember how many plants we ended up actually charging it with. I think it was 10,000, 9,700 plants. Wow. So that kind of grow is used to trade marijuana for methamphetamine and fentanyl. Though that's, those are organized crime marijuana grows, which are completely different than the dude living in it on. Monroe Street in Corval and Philoma that's that's trading marijuana for you know video games or whatever you know it's that it, you're completely different level. Um, we haven't had a grow in town. We did, but three or four years in a row we got two or three grows a year illegal grows in town. We haven't had one in I want to say three years in town, um, which is good. We haven't had any. I knock on knock on. We haven't had a lot of marijuana related issues uh, the last three three-ish years we did when I first came here um uh on, on the, that scale now this right. one here was Chinese organized crime all five guys mob, these are mob guys this is a real this is like the real stuff you see on tv bad guys and they're all gone now they all split their um all their residents addresses were in New York or New Jersey um and they were tied into four or five other major um investigations put up being done by the FBI and DEA right now they're gone <laughs> gone the plate the properties out there they just basically my understanding is they abandoned it they just walked away from a six or seven hundred thousand dollar piece of property um wow. these are the real deal um buy a piece of property turn it into a marijuana grow bring in people from out of state to run it ship it back east to trade it for cocaine and methamphetamine and fentanyl and uh that's how they make money marijuana is like is a kind of an international drug currency wow um, right. so you can do some fun research on google if you want to look at that kind of stuff because but that's what that's the marijuana trade as opposed to what your the typical drug trade where you you're selling it to make profit on users marijuana um a lot of it is in trade for other drugs wow all right um, so and, and what what do you think would be the impact if we were to have a dispensary here in town oh i don't know a couple of years ago, I would have had one answer. Now I know there. I, if you ask the Corvallis chief, he'd tell you don't ever do it because it it's it brings a lot of other things like people using drugs in a car and they've come to your dispensary from another area and they're already drunk or high. They, there's a lot of a crime associated with the dispensary. Just it's like any other kind of thing. It's like um, you're going to get the the legal people, but then you're going to have a certain component of illegal. Um, when I say illegal. I don't mean that they're buying it illegally from the from the dispensary. It's just the associated crimes. Um, gotcha. I, you know, I don't have a. I can't give you a, 
a Philomath answer. Um, I, I would, if it, if it was me living in Philomath, I, I would rather not, it, I don't live in Philomath, so that's, you guys do. Um, I'd rather not um, deal with it because you just get, you get a different, you get some clientele that come, would come to town that you don't want, that are, don't maybe don't live in this town that you don't want in town. I can't put a number on that. I can't quantify sure. it. I'm just telling you from anecdotal information from the other chiefs and sheriffs, that's, a, that's an issue. Yeah, you could go buy marijuana in, in 10 minutes mm -hmm. and in Corvallis. Let, unless you guys are looking for a political thing for just getting revenue, you can make some money. The city can make some money on having a dispensary. Um, mm -hmm. I know we already get some sharing on that, um, but um, uh, I don't know. I, 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 I would advise against it if you're coming from strictly up law enforcement perspective, but there's other factors that you guys would have to weigh. Sure, thanks. Terribly. Uh, a mundane, uh, uh, buttery answer for you there. So, <laughs> okay. Um, the, the next thing, unless anything else on the DUIIs? Nope. Um, and I'll hit this lightly too, because I want a brief, um, can you uh, turn on my sharing capability there, Chris, by the way? Let's see if I can do this without screwing it up. Um, so I wanted to give you guys a brief on accreditation. This is our um, accreditation review year. So we are an accredited agency, and a lot of people ask, what the heck does that mean? Um, we have signed on with the Oregon Accreditation Alliance, which uh, for the Chiefs Association, I am the board chair this year. I've been a member for a long time. I'm a firm believer in accreditation. And basically what accreditation is and the benefits of it in a nutshell, and I could talk about this for hours because I love, I love talking about it because I think it's super important. It's basically an outside third-party view and oversight view of your agency. Um, and that group of people that that start or that oversee the the, the actual accreditation um, board from the Chiefs and Sheriffs Association um, have basically come up with a set of standards, minimum standards for police agencies to abide by to improve professionalism, transparency, and just quality of work. So I, if I can do it. Did you let? Uh, I was going to show you kind of an example of an accreditation standard, and then hopefully, if we can meet in person, one of the next in the next couple of meetings, I can actually show you uh, uh, how we have to prove that we're meeting the standards, mm -hmm. and show you a file, and then talk about like our last year our report that we got the last time we um, were accredited, and how it kind of works, and what the overall benefit for me personally is, and for, I believe the city and the, and the, 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 the number one benefit, obviously professionalism within the department, number one, policy um, adherence is number two, but number three, kind of a distant third, but it's, it's an impactful, uh, agencies that are accredited very rarely get successfully sued for anything. Right. Um, we haven't had a successful lawsuit since I've been a chief here. Um, we've been tort claimed every year. You got one right now on a stop that we made recently. We get tort claimed every year. We send our the, the tort claim to, to CIS. They review our case, our body camera, pro, you know, uh, videos, and our, our, our policies on a particular issue. And then every single time um, CIS says, bring on your lawsuit, we'll fight you because um, everything was done properly. And that's the way we continue to do that is by adhering to these standards that are set um, by the Oregon Accreditation Alliance. And, I was gonna show you one if I can actually do it. Chris, how do I do it? I don't see how to share. Am I, is, did you, were you able to do it? Okay, share screen. Okay, I'm gonna keep talking here while I share and to see if you guys see when I'm sharing. Let's see, let's see. Okay, can you guys see? Yeah, we see it. Hey, it worked. Woohoo! Okay, so I had this one, this is, so just so you know, we have 233 different standards that we're required to abide by and then provide proof that we're abiding by that standard. I brought up an easy one to kind of explain to you how it works. This is the use of firearm standard. There's many um, standards involving firearms and use of force and firearms proficiency and those kinds of things. But I brought this up because it's got a mul multiple um, uh, bullet points that I want to just show you. It's boring, but let me just show you how it works. So we're required to abide by standard 1.3.3, 1 
And when we have our on-site visit from, so every year we get um, uh, uh, review, but every three years we have a full on-site review where they go through every, all the standards, every one of them. And we have to have actual physical proof that we have, that we completed the standard. And for instance, the use of firearms. So it says a written directive governs the use and reporting of incidents involving the discharge of firearms and at a minimum should include the following. Statutory authority, blah, blah, blah. Policy governing the use of warning shots. Policy governing shots fired from or at a moving vehicle. The use against dangerous animals or, or to dispatch, kill an injured animal. And report of a weapon discharge. The purpose at the bottom is to provide clear-cut policies on the legal and legitimate use of firearms in those circumstances that are deemed unacceptable and to establish report requirements for any discharge of a firearm, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what we have to do is we have to have a very solid, comprehensive use of firearms policy, written policy, which we do. We use a, um, a system called Lexapol. I'll show you this in person one of these days. It's a, a consortium of policies. I think about uh, 190 agencies in Oregon use Lexapol and we share and we also um, standardize policies so that we all, all of our policies are very similar based on different factors. So when I get reviewed on our use of, uh, use of firearms policy, I will have to have a file that has the policy, this standard in it and that, and show that each one of those line items is directly mentioned in the policy. That's number one. Gotcha. Number two, I have to, I will have to go for the previous three years and find every single incident that we have used a firearm. Thank God it's only been for um, section D as in David on that policy. We have not had to kill anybody. We haven't had to shoot anybody. We haven't had to fire warning shots, which is against our policy, by the way. Um, we can't, we haven't shot at a moving vehicle um, and report of any, every, all of our weapons discharges. I will, I will have to go into our system and print out every single police report that mentions us having to kill an animal, um, either um, a dog that was trying to bite somebody or a deer that got hit by a car. I have to have that in the file. I have to show that the officer handled the gun properly, reported it properly told, you know, reported to the supervisor property and provide body cam video if the, if the reviewer wants to look at the, the actual video of us doing what we're saying we're doing in the report. So that being said, that's just for use of firearms standard. Out of the 233 other standards, there's everything that you can possibly imagine. Evidence, um, crime scene stuff, pursuits, um, Every aspect of law enforcement is covered by a standard. So um, in a nutshell, what that does for me um, in a small agency that allows us to you know, regularly all year and every three years during the big one, make sure we're doing, our, doing business right. Um, and so that I could come to you and say, not only do, can I report to you what I'm doing, but I've got a third party that comes in and does a review uh, our, so I have done reviews of other agencies. I can't review ourselves. I'm on the board, but a group of people will come in, go over every single file that we have, look at them, do inspections, interview officers um, at the agency, and then provide a year-end report of the, the final three years of our on-site review. I post the, the, our last one is posted on the website, on the city website. Um, but it's all things that can get agencies into big trouble if you don't do stuff right. Um, evidence management, um, uh, how our, what we are purchasing um, procedures for different kinds of equipment, um, use of force, how we report use of force. Like one of the new standards this year is that um, all police agencies in Oregon have, re have agreed to do all report, uh, use of force reporting to the FBI use of force database, national database. So every time we use force, um, we enter it into the FBI use of force database. We're required in use of force to have a yearly review of every single use of force, even though every individual use of force is reviewed by us, by managers, we have to write a report about it. Now, there is no law that says I have to do that. Um, I don't have to ever review any use of force by state statute or otherwise, but by Oregon Accreditation Alliance standards, 
Dave and I, the two supervisors, have to review. We have to interview the officer that used force. We have to make sure that we basically have to do an internal affairs investigation every time we use force based on the Oregon Accreditation Alliance requirement standards requirements, which forces us to do it, which I think is awesome. I, and I think it, you know, it just, and, and that all that, all that, those files are available for review. Chris, I briefed Chris on it, the stuff every year we've done it. Chris is involved. He's on top of this. He comes and reviews things. When we go through the thing, the actual review, um, we, we go through a lot of these different things because he has to have input on it. Um, I just think it's a super value. Now, I will tell you, it's expensive, not the, co the physical cost. It's $1,000 a year, which is hardly anything. Sure. But the, the time, it takes a lot of time to make sure that we're in complete compliance every year um, with these different reports and different uh, things we have to do as we go through the year. For instance, uh, the use of force reporting. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a comprehensive review. If we do for every single, we have to watch the video start to finish of every single use of force. We have to, Dave and I have to meet, we have to write a report. At the end of the year, we have to have a committee of an officer um, and a supervisor. So it's me, Dave, and an officer from the union. And we go through every single use of force and then we write a recommendation of training that may be needed. That if we believe we see a, like a deficiency in some area, we write a report that says we've reviewed all these cases and we recommend that everything was done properly or we really should focus on um, let me come up, uh, better takedown methods for when we, uh, somebody used, uh, tries to pull away when we're handcuffing them to get them to the ground, or whatever that happens to be. Um, so... It's, it's, a, it's a good program, it costs money because there's kind of a hidden cost of uh, participation, but um, I wouldn't work at an agency that wasn't accredited. I'll just tell you that right now. I've done, sure. been doing this for 38 years. Um, I think there's well-run agencies in the state and I think there's poorly run agencies in the state. And this is a, a mechanism that allows us overview and you guys um, can come and look at it anytime you want. Uh, where we stand on it. You can look at our files. You can look at our proofs. Um, and I think that's really important um, that you guys have that capability. And Matt, when you come, like I did with Teresa, I'll be glad to show you physically how it works. Okay. This year is the first year we're doing it online. There's a system that we're used to put the data in, but I've got our last year's files. It's this gigantic file folder of all 233 separate folders with all the proofs and the reports in it. And I could get a couple of those out and sit down and show you what it actually physically looks like that I've actually pulled police reports on every one of these things. And here they are in a stack. And here's where it says that we did this right or this wrong. And it allows us to make improvements um, as we're going along. If we make mistakes, uh, we got to recognize them and fix them. So I, I think it's a super valuable program. Um, and as we move forward this year, I'll be talking to you guys about it um, because this is the year. This is our review year. We get reviewed in January or February of 2023, but this is the year that I have to build the proofs for the prior gotcha. three years. Um, and I'll be going, I'll be, what I did last time, which I thought was fun, fun, uh, is like when I'm doing the big ones, there's five, the five big ones, like use of force, pursuit policy, those kind of things, our evidence review. I will brief you on what I'm finding when I'm doing my review. Nice. And I think, I think that's an interesting kind of endeavor to go through with you guys as a, as a committee. So sure. yeah. I know this is kind of a, just a short kind of a sales pitch for the program, um, but uh, I think it's incredibly important as we move forward. Um, I, I, I'm very, really proud to share it with you guys how we do on these things. I think um, the agency has run really well and we get high marks. Um, every time we go through our reviews, I mean, the, the highest marks. And you'll, you'll hear the reviewer say, Paloma's one of the top two or three small police agencies in the state uh, because of our compliance with um, our reviews, so. Sure, and the policies uh, come from an external source or are they derived internally or? Like I'm the policy that, that up. Yeah. Yeah, um, so um, Lexapol, provides a, a sample policy for all, it's a huge, and if you, same thing, if you ever get bored and want some good nighttime reading, on the, uh, on the website, if you go under police, uh, our policy manual is there, the whole thing. Um, 
But the way that is, is done is we have agreed um, to look at Lexapol as our base product. And the reason it's important is because Lexapol employs lawyers and they consult with the Oregon Department of Justice for case law updates and for um, standardization purposes. Um, they, they work with the Oregon Department of Justice criminal division lawyers to make sure that the policies are enforceable and challengeable by, by lawsuits if they come, right? So that's number one. Number two, we also have agreed regionally in our, in our regional agreement that we don't operate in a vacuum. I think it's incredibly important that we don't have a, a significantly different policy than Corvallis PD does or the, the new Oregon State University Police or the Sheriff's Department because we interact with each other regularly on everything. So if we had a different policy about how we handled DUIIs and, and we were being backed up by the Sheriff's Department, that would be really, really right. um, bad way to do business. So right. yeah. when we make policy changes, I, we share them with all the agencies. Um, and we share them with our union um, to make sure that they're, that's, a, that's by statute and by agreement, by the way, because uh, they're directly affected by that. And of course, I work with Chris if there's any any changes, significant changes to our policy. And when legislative changes come, like the last couple of years, we've had a number of direct policy changes that we had to make. I don't know if it'll, let me uh, uh, see if I can bring my other screen up. I don't know, I brought that one up. I actually, let's see, how do I get, how do I switch documents? Can I just click it and that'll switch? Okay, there it is. My email. Just click it. Okay, so then um, let me show you this. We're just giving an, an example of, let's see if this will open full or not. Um, okay, you can, can end you this, see this. You can end the share screen and then go back into it if you need to. Okay, can you see this document? No. Yeah. You don't see a document that's called Oregon Alliance, Accreditation Alliance at the top? No. Nope. No. Uh, what do you see right now? Same one that's before? Same yes. One. Um, Just grab it and drag it over to your other screen, Ken. I only have one screen. Um, uh, so I think you'll have to unshare and then reshare again. Okay, stop share. Okay, I'm back. Yep, you're back. And <laughs> can you see that, or do you? What do you see now? Nothing. You got to go down to share again. Go to share screen and then click on the uh, document you want to share. Okay. It's this one. You guys see that? Yep. Yes. Okay. So for instance, here's a great example of when we, luckily I'm on the board, so I get to see this way ahead. But this year, we're implementing this new change to a, a particular, this, it's this accreditation standard, which is deployment of chemical agents. This last year, the legislator, the legislation, legislature, um, enacted several laws regarding the use of tear gas. So what we do is we write a new standard that is shared with all the agencies all over the state that are accredited, and they and then we write them and in, and basically massage them and then get them approved by the legislative committee that wrote the law to make sure that this complies with the new law change. So we don't have chemical agents. We don't have them at all. We don't use them. We would rely on the sheriff's department SWAT team to do it. But this is just an example of how we would change a written directive that would be um, enforceable by the accreditation standard. We do the same exact thing with policy, uh, Matt. Sure. If we have a policy change, so if this, even though we have a policy on use of gas, we don't use it, but we do, I have to change the policy to meet this standard and the new law change. So we do that, all the agencies, we share them. And then once we all approve the way we wrote the language, we enact them into our lexable policy. So the lexable policy um, is changeable, um, but only on a wide shared, you know, non-vacuum way. Um, gotcha. you know, the, um, and it's a really uh, um, solid way to change pol policy changes can get you in big trouble legally. We make a policy change, and it hurt, and we hurt somebody because of it, or somebody gets hurt, and uh, because we didn't do a good job of vetting that policy, um, and, and especially like use of force, pursuit policies, things that directly um, the ability to 
kick somebody's door in if they're having a medical emergency, those kinds of things. If we change a policy and we don't do uh, what is kind of the this industry standard, we can get sued big time. The city can, you guys. Um, will right. Be, right. So um, I think that's incredibly important to do that. Am I back on the regular screen? Yes. You are. Okay. Um, so that's it. I just wanted, um, does that answer your question, Matt, about policies? Yep. And um, it's on the it's on the website. I could show you how we, uh, we actually also, just so you know, because we use the Lexapol database, any change, they're, they're archived as we go. So if we um, make a change internally it, and we write, we type it into the policy, it actually, the, the version change gets shared and stored. And that's a requirement, uh, 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 Oregon Accreditation Alliance requirement that we keep uh, versions of policies so that if we do get sued, that's that's what lawyers always ask. I want not I want your current policy, but I also want your last eight reviews and changes of that policy so I can see why you changed the policy because they want to try to find a flaw, right? So sure. Gotcha. Um, and um, because they're reviewed by um, the, the, the lawyers at Lexapol and the Department of Justice, um, they're solid. When we get them, they're really thought out um, and uh, have been um, a lot of vetting has taken place by a lot of agencies and the system. So nice. Yeah, it, I love Lexapol. I, 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 I wish I had it when I was at DOJ because we did everything from scratch there. And it, it took, took, when you go to change a policy, it's it's brutal, uh, very difficult to do. So sure. any other questions about that? Nope. No. OK, lastly, uh, we have the traffic management program, final review and recommendations. You guys didn't really uh, you and Catherine obviously didn't weigh in on this. I mean, we're basically done with the draft um, the way I see it. Um, Chris, do you want to weigh in? I think we're I think it needs to go to the council. Uh, that's just my view and see if the, any of the people on the council want to weigh in on um, corrections or the way that the city wants to manage it. I mean, the department's going to manage it a particular way um, anyway, based on the way we wrote it, which I think is solid. I have also taken that uh, the draft of that, I've shared it with the sheriff and the, um, the Corvallis police chief, because it is a policy. We're enacting this as a policy. You guys can act this, enact this as a program, but uh, I'm also writing a policy that's gonna go in our policy manual on how we interact with this program. Mm -hmm. So I did share it around. I think it's been pretty well vetted. Um, obviously room for any kind of additions later or anytime you guys wanna make them, we can make word changes or whatever you want, but um, I, I didn't expect that you were going to review it, Matt, you know, before this meeting and make have recommendations or whatever, but um, you're right. welcome to shoot me any recommendations you have. And I've, I've included all the changes that we've gone along from all the counselors that have been on the committee, Teresa, you know, all, all over me on the way I spelled certain things and different things. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I will tell you this, the way we laid it out, it's, it, you may not like that, that I wrote it. Um, so it would fit our policy manual. <laughs> oh, okay. That, it's that you can see it, it's written like a policy. Um, so I will have chapters and all that I have to do is put the chapter numbers and letters on it to just put it in there and send it to Lexapol. Um, so uh, that's why it's written in the format that it's written as gotcha. opposed to like a, a big narrative uh, uh, program. Uh, is there any comments you have on it now? Um, Chris, do you have any uh, where you wanna go? next or how you want to handle the vote or go into the council i think just generally this is a, a timing issue this got a really good final review by the police committee and it was kind of like well let's just make these changes and give it to us one more time before we send it to the city council and then the next meeting got canceled and the next meeting got canceled and then here we are with a new committee member so Really, this got a pretty good review. I feel like um, everybody on the city council is going to have a chance to review it when it gets that level. So I'd rather than delay this, I, my recommendation would be to go ahead and vote to send this to the city council for consideration, um, knowing that everybody's going to get a shot at it then. But I agree with Ken. I think it's well well written. Uh, you know, I, I think it's going to provide citizens with an opportunity to be able to reach out to the city and engage with the city on safety concerns for their neighborhood and it gives the city kind of a program that we can follow so that we're making sure we're treating similar situations uh, equitably or equally depending on what the situation is so we you know just just because you complain the loudest doesn't mean that you get all the amenities on your street versus somebody else that maybe lives on a more dangerous street 
and we only hear one or two complaints and they don't get anything, right? So this gives us a little bit more systematic way to evaluate safety concerns on city streets and take appropriate action. So I think it's a good step, good program. And that'd be my recommendation is to go ahead and take a formal vote and move it on to the city council. Okay, so we need a motion for that, Chris, correct? Yep, that'd be most appropriate. All right. Well, is it's all right, I'll make, I'll move that we uh, forward the Philomath Neighborhood Traffic Management Program to the City Council for approval. And I'll second it. All right. All right. Uh, all in favor? Any, no. So unanimous, it will go forward. Thank you. So that passed unanimously. And moving will... forward too, Matt, if you read it and you say, well, this, I don't get, uh, this is stupid or whatever part that you don't like, shoot me whatever you got, I'll, I'll integrate it as a note or whatever. And as we move forward to the city council, we can present them with, you know, whatever change you might, you guys might have sure. to um, okay. moving forward. And then how we run the program later, after you guys discuss it at the council, um, we could tweak those things and, and customize those things too. Um, I okay. like it a lot. And I'll do give you my one final word here is that I also think um, that I've talked about this a lot in this committee and Peggy's heard me tell, when you make traffic changes, um, you, any kind of traffic control changes is dangerous. And you, you may not believe me, but you ask any uh, traffic engineer, we've talked to the traffic engineer at Corvallis, uh, you are, our city is responsible if we make a change, which I think we should. There's places in town where we should make changes, but I think we need a process to protect us on how we come to that change and the documentation of that chain of those issues. And I think this program, uh, especially ones that come from a citizen, it's great. I, that is where it should start and how we get involved and how we manage that and the decisions that the council makes in this committee, um, I think is really important moving forward that we have a structure to it so that we can stand behind it if um, we make a change and then, or even a temporary change or we test, it, test something. Um, I think this gives us a lot of um, protection for doing it the right way. Um, and as you read through it, I think you'll see that. Um, and um, I also got copies of other plans. Um, this part that you don't know, uh, numerous cities that we talked to the city engineer in Corvallis. And we also talked to an OSU um, engineer about different things. And uh, at this time, we, that's how kind of we kind of came up with this, um, this framework, so. Okay. And I'll just tell you up front, I haven't read it yet. Okay, so. good. Uh, right before you go to bed with a nice scotch <laughs> or uh, a, a whiskey uh, is a good place is to start. Is that the best way? <laughs> that's, the best, that's just my opinion. Um, uh, but, that's how uh, we wrote it, right? Yeah, yeah <laughs> clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa said, were you intoxicating when you wrote section three or whatever? And I was like, yeah, I probably was. Um, that's definitely, I don't know, boy. It's, just, it's a doozy. It's a doozy. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't educated in one of Teresa's classes. So it's very clear <laughs> there. Um, <laughs> yeah oh goodness well thank anything you anything else for the good of the order um on uh i will send out uh uh for Catherine's sake meeting times whatever you guys decide um that way we can get her included i feel bad that she missed some of this but um i'll just reiterate to you matt please come by um have a cup of coffee um and we'll we'll, we'll uh, talk about some other stuff and give you a, a brief and then that'll give you an opportunity to ask budget questions and sure is there, a, is there a good time this week for you? I'm going to be out all next week. I, I'm out next week too. Um, this week, today's Tuesday. Tomorrow's WCJC. Thursday's good. Friday I'm off because I'm leaving. I'm going to Reno and do, take a, doing a trailer uh, camping thing. Um, oh, nice. Uh, but after the week after that, wide open. Too. Okay. Let's, so, let's try and do that. Then, okay. Yeah. Show okay. me some times or whatever and I'll have some stuff ready for you. And we'll, okay. When one other thing I'd like to give Peggy a minute is, um, for the record, Peggy, is there something you'd like to I'll give you a few minutes here to express any concerns or ideas or thoughts about today's meeting? Sure. I'm not sure if, is the uh, sound working correctly? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay. This is a new monitor. So um, uh, one thing is I know that, so going in front of the city council, is that when the actual I, because I view this this great document as a as a policy, like you know, Chief said, um, would the management program actually be discussed where actually citizens are involved? 
or is the citizen involvement going to be as far as you know, we see a problem like a uh, police chief said last March that there's more tickets for it. Um, there's more speeders on 15th Street than 9th Street. So what would be the next step for a citizen? Or is there still going to be a citizens committee arranged? Yeah. That's more of a city council thing than, than a police thing. What do you, Chris? No, yeah, that, that's what yeah. I'm just asking that yeah. for, for Teresa is, is mm -hmm. I understand the city council is going to be discussing whether or not they should adopt the, the draft. Um, I don't know if everybody got the email from Teresa. I don't think so. That was sent to me, uh, but it's actually a committee of people that will be um, addressing certain things. Or is that being, is that not going to be discussed? Am I making myself clear? I'll, I'll, I'll give you my view of it. Uh, okay. Chris, Chris and I have just talked about this on the operational level. I, I, you guys can do whatever you want as a city council. I just, I don't think we have enough for you guys to have a regular meeting about it. Um, I think this committee here, as issues come up, we, this could be the committee we use to discuss these issues as they come up, but to have a standing committee, it would be boring. I think I, there would be like one or two issues here and then there wouldn't, there's not that, there's not enough work for a committee to do in my personal opinion this is something you guys could talk about as a as a council i think peggy could be a person or several people we can call when one of these comes forward and we can invite her to these meetings and have robust conversations especially when we get in person as part of the, the law enforcement committee meeting or however i don't know the best way to do it but i don't think you guys having a standing committee on traffic would produce other than have it have another meeting and have to have reports and that would be a waste of your time. That's just my personal view. You guys can talk about it uh, uh, amongst yourselves, as they say, but um, I, I don't know, what's your thought, Chris? I know we've talked about um, standing committees and those kinds of things are hard. Yeah, I mean, I think the focus on this program is citizens that have complaints can have a process, they can have those complaints be heard and to kind of go through it. But as far as who that complaint actually goes through, I. I agree with you, Ken, as we've talked about this, that we just we just don't get a whole lot of complaints about traffic and to, to, to try to stand up a separate committee just to oversee traffic complaints, I, I think may not be very useful, but we have existing committees, whether it's this committee or just be the city council as a body and complaints go to the city council, the city council can direct staff to take it through this process, go through the program would be appropriate too. So I, I think that's appropriate as part of the discussion of the city council. So um, when we prep this and Teresa can work with you as the, the past chair, uh, we prep the memo. Let's include that as part of the discussion for the city council to consider is who, who's going to actually run the, run the complaints through the program. Okay. So I will say this, and this is not stated because she's sitting here, Peggy's showing a lot of interest in this. And I am a firm believer, if you've got an interest in these kinds of topics, these, this is the it's important that you're involved. And I, I think, you know, this committee, we meet regularly. And if a, a topic came up, I would I would be in favor of inviting a select few people to show up and have these discussions with us as we move forward and, and call it whatever you want to call it, a standing committee or whatever. But if Peggy's on the list, we're going to call her and say, hey, we're going to have a meeting on Tuesday at three. We're going to discuss this, tra this particular traffic issue. Please, please show up. We need your input. I, I have no problem with that and I invite it. And there's certain people that are involved that that know about these issues um, and we should reach out to them. Um, having a standing committee where you meet every every month or whatever, I just don't know um, if that would be worth your guys' time. So yeah, it might function kind of like the if you're familiar with the public works committee and the tree committee, how that works. I mean, the tree committee is essentially the three members of the public works committee plus a couple of additional members that are you know citizen members that are non-elected but they're appointed to that and they just meet as needed right they don't meet every time the public works committee meets um, they just meet when there's specific tree related topics and so i i think that might be a good pattern to to look at and consider so yeah it's, peggy it's a good point i think we'd add that add that into the discussion and that was to that was discussed like about a year ago um 
Ruth Cosby was pretty much um, pretty interested in that of having the committee. I don't know with um, Ken if you remember that, but it yeah, would be yeah. like three the committee yeah. members and a few citizens that are interested, which there are. I had said that I could sure. probably get some even just on our street. So if there's not going to be a separate committee, what what is what what will an individual take if it's not me? Then if it's my neighbor who's concerned with the with the traffic, what would be the next step? Okay. If it's not coming to um, this committee, or or would it be coming to again to the city council? So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I, that, yeah, that's what I'm trying to avoid, at least personally as a police chief. Is if somebody's speeding down your street, is uh, I, I don't think the city council. Uh, I'm saying this kind of jokingly cares about that. Um, that's that's my job. Um, I had a lady write a letter last week, and she was very upset about traffic on Southwood. And wanted you know wanted to have a, a big conversation about it. that should start with me, and as a complaint about traffic. Well, I did exactly what you're supposed to do. We made a traffic um, enforcement plan. I sent an email to everybody in my department. Guys are required now to do traffic enforcement on that street to test to see what the issue. We've had the the radar reader up there three different times now um, over the last six months. That's the beginning. Like if you read the pol the policy, that's kind of like where it should start. And then if, if, I, if I came as part of that and came to you guys and said, look, enforcement's not working on street A, 15th street. We need to have you enact this committee and have a, a deeper dive into this and start looking at all these other factors that are already written down in this plan and start going through this plan for that street. Then that's where my view of it, I would call Peggy and whoever else volunteered for that program and let's get in a room and let's start talking about this and then go through the go through this through the process that's in the plan. But that's how I look at it. So my answer to you, Peggy, would be, I think we need to do a better job. And one of the things we came out with on just talking about this is a lot of people are afraid to call the police on, on just neighborhood traffic stuff. It's just like, they don't see it as an emergency. So they don't, they don't think, oh, I, can, I can't call 911 on this. And one of our plans is to, do, uh, to put stuff in the newsletter. We've got this plan, but on the side of the plan, if you've got a traffic issue on your street or you see regularly, at, let's say a crossing guard problem or a, you know, whatever it is, here's the mechanism. Call our non-emergency number, get it in the queue. We get that way. It's documented that there's a complaint. We, we, we do a certain thing, which like I just explained, we put that out to our officers and we, we address it. Um, and we have guys sitting there and we document it. And when tickets are written they're it's official. Right. And that's the kind of premise and the basis for our whole program is to do that first. So once we do that, and if it's a speed thing, we get the radar unit out there, all those things, then we have some data. And, and, and I, you may not like my answer if I make a recommendation or not, but that if we get a room, people in a room and say, well, I don't care about your recommendation. We need to go to this next level. Great, I'm all for that. I, I'm not perfect, we're not perfect. And sometimes we don't see things that you see. So I think it's- so. so so since we've already been down this road, we've already on 15th Street, you've already, you know, we've, it's already been discussed that there's a problem of 15th Street, has been for years. Um, we've had the radar. Um, what would be the next step? Um, maybe, it's, maybe just you and I need to have a conversation. I don't know. Well, that's, that's, that's one of these ones that we can, yours, yours is easy because we've done a lot of stuff. Right. Yeah, we can we can get we can have this we can discuss this in this group right here with Catherine and have a meeting and say here's the data here's what Peggy and her cohorts think on the street this is the data what do you guys think and start and talk about it um, and then make a decision okay do we need to do these other temp go to go down the policy do we need to do these temporary fixes what are okay. they are they speed bumps are they rumble strips do we want to spend this money. City Council, do we want to spend money on this, or do we need some new striping? Do we need a new sign? Okay. And have the just and have the discussion, right? And I think that's this this process just puts a more official, non a non for, uh, a more formal uh, process in place compared to just you and me having a chat. Um, right. Okay. About, right? Peggy, yeah. It's also very sequential. It, it's this step, and then we if that passes, I mean, you know, it's kind of a pattern in which to follow sequentially to get the best document and um, and decide what is the best, best solution. Okay, 
so for for right now it sounds like there's there's um let's see the the traffic management program which includes citizens that's what that's how it's talked about in the transportation set plan anyway that's the plan it's right. actually it's a, it's it's not so much as this policy but it's actually it is a committee. The feeling right now is there, uh, it would be, uh, there would not be enough to talk about unless somebody comes and says that there, that there's issues on their street. You guys, you guys can do whatever you want. Um, <laughs> you, 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 you could go up in Chris's ear and do whatever you guys needed to make a decision. I'm well, just giving you, I, I'm just giving you, I think, the, what I see as just the enforcement side of it. Because this sure. is not just enforcement, right, Peggy? We're not, half, as a matter of fact, this has really very little to do with enforcement to get once we get to this plan, right? Um, right. We, we've done enforcement. We've got to a point where Ken Rubin thinks that enforcement's not fixing whatever Peggy's problem is. I'm just using you as an example. I'm not, you know. It's actually not, not my problem. Yeah, I'm not, making a, not, yeah I'm not making light of this because everybody's got issues. But um, right. this is where we we agree that there's some other measure that needs to take place to fix what you guys think is the issue. And we need to talk about it. Yeah. And uh, thank right? you for all the work that you put into this draft. It's it's really no, you, great. Hey, you, 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 you made recommendations too. Some of your stuff, there's stuff in here from everybody. And I appreciate your involvement. And um, I think this is important. This is a great example of working with the community to fix something or come up with a program that sure. could benefit everybody, right? So right. that's what it is. And from now on, how we work it and the city council's involvement, that's another thing. I will, I'm just telling you personally that, you know, getting the enforcement done is a phone call. Um, we're right. constantly looking for people to call us if, if there's an issue or a particular driver or a particular time of the day where you see things. That's how we, we're, we're not on your street every day all day because you are. Um, yeah. So um, we're busy doing other things and we need to know when there's an issue and that's how we know. And, and some people, we just need to do a better job of letting people know we want them to call. It's not an emergency, but we want them to call and let us know or send us an email and here's how to do it. And I think that's one of the flaws of um, our operation right now is getting that word out on how to how to get people to call us. Um, so that's, that's separate from everything else, but um, sure. anyway, um, I appreciate your involvement, Peggy, and have from day one of this thing. I think it's been great. Yes. I'm going to bad math you as soon as I hang up on you, though, but it's okay. <laughs> well, no, we'll hear about it later. <laughs> Before we go, I had uh, just a quick question. I don't sure. know if we need to expand on it today, but I was wondering how much the police department is involved in patrolling within the urban growth boundary, but maybe outside of city limits. A lot. Um, that's a, a that's also our and I'll show you when you come. We have a interagency agreement, a multi-agency agreement on our patrol area. We mm -hmm. patrol basically, um, if just give give me some de general parameters up 19th Street all the way to the top where it curves to um, uh, West Hills Road. Mm -hmm. We patrol all the way to 53rd Street. I mean, mm -hmm. not when I say patrol, that doesn't mean going down down neighborhood. We're just traffic control, traffic patrol. We make our guys make loops regularly at night. All the way to 53rd Plymouth and back around the back. Um, we we write tickets on Chapel and Bell Fountain regularly, um, okay. and but the county does the same exact thing and 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 they they same thing. They're in town. All you see sheriff's cars all sure. the time, and that's our reciprocal agreement that they are in town. They handle calls for us all the time. Okay. Um, um, like when I was giving you the DOI example earlier, when we have when we're out, they're they're the ones that are going to calls. Um, mm -hmm. For instance, a funny, this funny side story to that is this guy sent a letter into the city the other day. Chris and I were talking about it. it says, oh, I get stopped for no reason all the time coming into town. And 10% of the time I drive through town, I get stopped. And it's like, oh, uh, so uh, I ran his name in his car. And um, he's been stopped a total of three times ever. Um, because dispatch has records for every single traffic stop. Sure. And he's been stopped three times. There. We've only stopped the guy once. Um, ever. Um, mm -hmm. And the county stopped them once and Corvallis PD stopped them once. Um, he's only been stopped once inside the city limits of Philomath. So it's like, I don't know why he was doing this to apply pressure for us to stop, not stop him for some weird reason. I don't know. Right. But um, 
that's just an example of, I mean, Ben County stops cars in, t- in town every day um, sure. and write tickets um, in town regularly. So we don't, those stats that we put out aren't, don't include them, but that's our reciprocal agreement on all crimes, on major crimes. We're part of a team that handles, like when we had the murder suicide, um, they, I mean, Ben County and uh, Corvallis PD spent 30 or 40, 50 hours helping us on that. Easy. Right. Their detective units. Um, we share that. I think we're the benefit. We benefit more from it um, than the other agencies do. But Chris will tell you, when there's a major crime team coming out, I run them a lot of the times. I run the I run the big mate, the, the murder cases because I've got experience doing that. And um, but it's good for the agency to participate because it improves our quality of investigations that our officers are involved in. So I sell that to Chris um, come from a little bit of a different angle. But mm-hmm. um, uh, that is, those mutual aid agreements um, are in place and we do patrol that that boundary all the way around. Um, okay. Out west, we go out to about the curbs on a regular okay. bit, you'll see guys out there mm-hmm. regularly, um, just making the loop all the way like sure. Wood, uh, Woods Creek and coming back around Grange Hall. That's just part of our our patrol area. Awesome. And so at some point, probably not within the next 12 months, but probably not too far from that, I'm gonna be interested in seeing some statistics on particularly um, traffic violations in, in, you know, like you mentioned, Plymouth is a great example, or West yep. Hills, mm-hmm. as I feel like congestion on highway, on Florida Boulevard is just forcing more people out to the fringes and alternatives. Absolutely. And I think it's going to become a major safety issue. So I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I have a, um, a, a citation and traffic stop um, a dashboard that was built for our new reporting system nice. that I can bring up a map and show you every stop we've made every warning we've given and every ticket we've given at, at real time. Nice. And awesome. it'll show you exactly where the guys are, what, if they're outside the city limits, inside, everywhere. Um, so when you come and visit, I'll show you um, okay, perfect. how it works. And we can talk about that. I, I couldn't agree more with you. Awesome. Couldn't agree more. Thanks. Great question and great, uh, very, very interesting. Well, um, if there is nothing else, thank you so much, Chief Rubin and Chris, uh, Councilor Lehman, Peggy, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for the invitation. If nothing further, this meeting is going to be adjourned. Okay, great, great. Thanks, everyone. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. <laughs>